Hello, everyone, and welcome to Rogers Center for the first of a three-game set against the Boston Red Sox. It'll be the third series this year between these two clubs, and so far the Jays have been dominant in 6-1. and one. We saw these Red Sox here in the opening series of 2020 in which well, the Blue Jays swept them. They looked excellent in doing so, so we'll see what this series has in store for us. It'll be Chase Anderson on the mound for the Blue Jays today. And in that first series, Anderson looked a whole lot better when he faced the Red Sox than he did just this past week as he faced them at Fenway Park. He lost that game. It was a similar matchup. It was Chase Anderson against Marcus Walden. Walden came out on top of that one. Anderson wasn't able to get uh, past the third inning. He only went three, gave up three runs, and that just wasn't enough. So we welcome you to the Virtual Jays Network. My name is Jackson Farrell. And the voice you just heard is Drew Frank joining me in the broadcast booth today. And we are underway. So we appreciate you joining us for game number 29. We're moving quickly here. So well over a month into the 2020 regular season now. And Blue Jays on their most recent road trip to, uh, let's see here, they went to Tampa, and they went to Boston, and they went to Baltimore. And they went 5-4 and four in doing so. Honestly, pretty good result for a, a young team that you know really wasn't expected to contend. There's six games above 500 now, as that one's grounded up in front of the catcher Jansen. He'll make the play, so the leadoff hitter Ben Intendi is retired. And a nice play by Jansen at first. Really bang, bang. Not much wiggle room there when it came to timing that throw up, and he got it off and got the out, but not an easy play. Oh, and that turn, I mean, I think he thought that ball was going to dribble foul. I think he wanted it to, or perhaps not wanted it to. I think he wanted to get that to first, but sure was a close one, but a good play regardless. So it'll be Rafael Devers up now. And we've seen him a ton so far this year. And in the last series at Fenway Park, uh, the second stop of that road trip, Devers went 3 for 12. And these Red Sox are coming off of a tough weekend in Minnesota after they played the Jays Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. The two teams parted ways, the Jays to Boston and the Red Sox to Minnesota. They dropped the first two games of the series, giving up 19 runs between Friday and Saturday's game. They bounced back and had a nice performance on Sunday, just yesterday, winning for the one, but the Twins' bats were all over those Red Sox pitchers throughout the first two games, that's for sure. Rotation's a real struggling point in Boston this season. Just go listen to some sports radio over there. <laughs> it's an absolute gong show right now. And of course, the Red Sox 12 and 18 on the year. And the Blue Jays, on the other hand, 17 and 11 as Devers walks. So essentially opposite records for these two clubs early on here. <laughs> Something you don't see all the time between the Red Sox and the Blue Jays. If I told you at the start of the year they'd have opposite records at this point, or close to, certainly wouldn't have the Blue Jays in front, but here we are. We're actually leading the AL East currently, these Blue Jays are. And they're half game up on the Yankees, so still very close. Boost of confidence, to say the least. And these teams are already familiar foes, of course, playing in the same division. They know each other. But this year, already their third season, third series against each other for the season. And the third start Anderson makes against the Rosox. And for the other side, the third start Marcus Walden's going to make against the Blue Jays tonight. So 2-1 to the DH, J.D. Martinez. That's Arguably the best pure hitter in this Red Sox lineup, although I don't think for too much longer. We've talked at length in the first couple series about the emergence of a guy like Rafael Devers, the consistency of a Xander Bogarts, craftiness of a Jackie Bradley Jr. I mean, his lineup still has a lot of different options, but, you know, some depth is the issue. You got, you know, Pedroia, obviously second baseman out for the year, uh, as Martinez is now in a full count, but, yeah, some lack of depth on this roster, and it's it's shown itself thus far. The payoff to JD. Swung on into left center field. Grichuk runs over and he'll make the play. So Martinez is retired. Devers returns to first. It's going to be two away for Xander Bogarts, the shortstop for the Red Sox today. And Grichuk hauls that one in center field. 
If he looks to his left, you'll see Teoscar Hernandez, as usual, playing right field for the Blue Jays. But if he looks to his right, you'll see the leadoff hitter, Kevin Biggio. He's forced out to the outfield today as Montoyo starts Travis Shaw at second base for the first time of 2020 for these Blue Jays. Yeah, he's got over 200, 270 career innings, actually, at second base. It's his first appearance there this season. So it's Bogarts at the play. One ball as that one's popped up into foul territory. Rowdy Telez back at first base for the Jays. Comes over, makes the play. So the Red Sox don't put anything on the board early on in the first year. So let's see what the Blue Jays can do. Coming up next on the virtual Jays Network. So it'll be Marcus Walden back on the mound for the Red Sox today. In the 6.56 ERA he carries into this one, largely because he hasn't gone deep in too many games there. You see just 23 innings thrown across his six outings so far. Faced the Jays twice, went four and a third in the first one, just four in the second one. We saw him go four just this past week as he faced the Blue Jays and ultimately lost that game. He pitched pretty well despite as I mentioned a relatively short outing he only gave up three hits and one run over that span striking out seven so while he's looked good in those performances to some extent they've just been too small a sample size for him to really lower that ERA too much yeah well in the sixes early on here for Walden who career minor leaguer debuted at the age of 29 back in 2018 uh, he's been thrust into this position in the Red Sox rotation. Allow me to correct myself, actually. Sorry, the one run was in his opening performance against the Blue Jays. And his last time out, he actually gave up three runs over four and a third. And it was a double that was able to be cashed in as Biggio struck a double off the monster in the third. And then the two other runs that scored were runners that he left on base when he was pulled from the game. He came out to start the fifth inning. He got one out, but then walked the nine-hitter Bichette and the leadoff hitter Biggio. Then he was lifted as Ron Renick, he made the call to the pen for Martin Perez, and Perez allowed both of them to score. So Walden tagged for three runs against the Jays in his last start. So it's Biggio at the plate, as you mentioned earlier, playing left field today. Gives the Blue Jays lots of options with his versatility defensively as he strikes out swinging there, but hitting just 194 on the year now after going 2 for 12 in the Baltimore series. His last five games, just 3 for 15. Not overly impressive. There was a triple in there, if you remember that, and he came around to score a couple times, but 3 for 15 at the top of the lineup is now Juan Montoyo's got him up there, and as a whole, he's looked okay in the leadoff spot. It's just been of a rough patch this past weekend. Here's a guy who hit great over the weekend. Three for eight in the two games he was in and a couple huge home runs. One yesterday late. It was in the seventh inning. Not only opened up the game for the Jays, it began the process of kicking Alex Cobb from the game, who at the time was absolutely dealing with the seventh, but chance in a big home run there. And then had a big one the other game as well as he was able to drive these balls just carry it. They really carry it, Candy Arrow, when they notice. Although they really do around all these ballparks. But yes, the seventh from the, uh, back uh, on Saturday. He hit a big one in the ninth inning. And that's one of the reasons you see Jansen in the lineup as well as McGuire for the second day straight. 
They both were big factors at the plate in yesterday's afternoon game to help win the series in Baltimore. Montoyo adjusts his lineup to keep them both in there again tonight. Nope. So Jansen walks. And that'll bring up Randall Gritchuk, the center fielder. Batting third, the center fielder. Randall Gritchuk. I think what we're going to see a lot from Walden here is he's going to have to work around uh, these Jays bats. Now that they've seen him a couple times, they're going to be taken, they're going to be battling. I don't think it's more difficult once you've you know come up and now they've seen your stuff, right? So be interesting to see what he can accomplish today and vice versa. Gritchuk's hitting 291 to start the year. He's been fantastic, and he lifts one into left. Ben Intendi doesn't have to move much. Makes the play. So two now down for Vlad Guerrero Jr. Back at third base today in the cleanup spot. And, I mean, he's been lights out recently. Just one for six in the series against Baltimore, a couple walks, but... Against Boston last week at Fenway, he went 5 for 11, 4 RBI. And this season, 8 for 19, 3 home runs against Boston. Wow. And he was doing it in style. Those 3 home runs, really all balls that were hit hard. Not wall scrapers, not balls that just barely snuck out of the park. One of them up and over the monster, one to the deepest part of the park in Fenway, the straightaway center field. And really making some statements with his bat. 15 home runs last year for the then rookie. Yeah, checks his swing there, or at least tries to. Call for strike one. Slider misses the inside part of the plate, so it's a 3-1 count now. Guerrero is one of many Blue Jays happy to be back here at Rogers Center. The team as a whole is 10-4 at home as opposed to 7-7 seven seven on the road. Now they face some tough opposition over their road trips, but at home they've really been clicking. Payoff pitch, swung on and missed, so a couple strikeouts in the first inning for Marcus Walden as he looks to get off to a good start in this one here in Toronto. Welcome back on the Virtual Jays Network. Blue Jays Red Sox here in Toronto. The Jays' first game back after a nine-game road trip. And they welcome in the Boston Red Sox for a three-game series here. It's scoreless as we kick things off in the second now. Toronto ahead of Boston by six games in this relatively young season. I mean, there's enough games up in the standings that you can kind of start to take away some conclusions and you look at the numbers I mean the Jays team ERA is over a full run lower than Boston's 2.83 for Toronto 3.94 for Boston but Boston's triple slash line collectively each of those categories are all higher than Toronto at the plate so they've been producing a bit better um, the batters have for the Red Sox than the Blue Jays but the Jays pitching is what's led to that separation in the standings Especially that bullpen as well. You had some really key arms in there for Toronto. That's They've just had really good starts to the year. Shun Yamaguchi pitching a ton of innings. Justin Miller looking really solid. Bass, Giles, of course. As Moreland strikes out to lead off the second inning here. Anderson's first strikeout on the day. And it gets it down and inside on Moreland. Generates a swing and miss on a ball that looked out of the zone. To finish off Moreland, who's up in the five hole tonight. Bringing up Michael Chavis, who's had some struggles in the field from what we've seen from him 
against the Blue Jays this year. Yeah, certainly a few uh, over there. And just 24. Still trying to work his way through you know, the ebbs and flows that come with life in the majors. He whiffs heavily on that off-speed pitch from Anderson. So a 1-1 count to Chavis. Same thing. Swing and a miss on the circle change. So Anderson working that off-speed early here against Chavis. And a 1-2. He's able to make contact this time, but it's foul down the third baseline. Two to Chavis fouled off. You'll notice the roof's still closed here at Rogers Center as we enter late April. And just came from a nice sunny weekend in Baltimore. It was beautiful weather. A couple afternoon games. And Camden Yards, man, there's nothing better, I'll tell you. So strikeout to Chavis there, back to back now. Two away quickly in the second for Anderson. And it's looking like we might see the roof closed a little bit longer. Got rain on the forecast all week. No rain today, but calling for it Tuesday through Friday. Supposed to see some sun over the weekend, so maybe circle the calendar. Maybe we see it Saturday, Sunday as the Jays finish off their uh, their series against the Yankees, who will be coming in town for the weekend. When the dome is open, it feels like the city just has a little more energy to it. You know, it feels a bit more like an event. And so we'll see that I'm sure a ton as the summer goes on. But first things first, it's Christian Vasquez at the plate. Hitting 213 on the year. And he went 3 for 10 in the last series. Had a big two-run shot uh, in that series over the monster at Fenway. Two balls, one strike. And he hit it against Tanner Roark, who pitched a beautiful game in Baltimore yesterday. And he's going to be one of the two pitchers that missed Boston in this series. And Vasquez now assuming the starting role in Boston. He did so last year as well. Really flourished at the plate especially. And he gets himself a two-out walk here. Off a full count. That's already his second walk allowed by Chase Anderson today in just the second inning. And he's had his walks under control pretty well so far this season. Yet to walk, he's only walked more than two batters in one game. And that was just three batters he walked against his Kansas City start where he only gave up two over six and two thirds. So the walks haven't hurt him yet, but already with two walks and just five batters retired here tonight. As you mentioned, last start, not the greatest one for him, albeit just two walks. Three earned runs allowed, however. We'll see what he gets up to today, trying to, as you mentioned, really lower that walk count, keep it low. He's up against a guy who doesn't walk too often. It's Kevin Pilar. Two to one to the right fielder is inside. It looks like a chance to try to throw to first as the ball got away from him a little bit, but that guy's certainly not running. 3-1 to Pilar. That one's fouled off, so full count now. Pilar, a former Blue Jay, went to San Francisco last season, as we've discussed. His best offensive season last year. As that one's hit deep in the left, and it's going to get past the outstretched arm of Biggio. Gritchett comes in to field it, but not before Christian Vasquez will score on a two-out RBI double from Kevin Pilar in his old ballpark. And it's hard to say whether or not this is Biggio's fault, per se, for not getting to that ball. Gets a pretty good jump on it, reads that one right, outstretches his arm and can't quite get there. It's easy to fault the second baseman for not necessarily ranging out there as an outfielder, but a ball that had double written all over it off the bat, it looked like. So it's one nothing Boston here in the second inning. And it's Jackie Bradley Jr. 284 in the year. As he flies one in the left, Biggio gets underneath it and makes the play. So Boston starts things off in this series and this game by scoring a run off of Kevin Pillar, RBI double. 
and we'll see what the Blue Jays can do to match that as we head to the bottom of the second on the virtual Jays Network. Welcome back to Toronto. It's going to be Travis Shaw now at the plate, playing second base today for the first time this season. As we mentioned, he does have some experience there defensively. He's yet to have any action so far tonight. The only ball hit on the infield was grounded just a few feet out in front of home plate when Jansen threw over the first base, and there was a pop-up over to the first baseman, Telez, but... Shaw, usually they say when you're in a different position, the ball will find you, or when you just come in defensively, they'll find you. It's found Biggio already twice tonight. Shaw yet to get a ball himself. So one-two count to the left-handed slugger. Fouls that one off. And we probably won't see too much of Shaw at second especially with all the second base options this team already has between Biggio and Panic, who play a lot of second. Now Ruben Tejada's in the mix, and even in the pinch, I mean, a guy like Bichette could slide over, and Lourdes Gurriel Jr. played a whole lot of second base the past couple of years, but tonight it's Charlie Montoya wanting to keep both catchers in the lineup after how well they played yesterday, and trying to get both Telez and Shaw in there as well means he has to get creative. So Shaw strikes out swinging. Then it's a really good job of Walden working inside there. Changing the eye line and gets Shaw to go. And that's his second strikeout with the slider on the outside of the plate there. Struck out Biggio with a fastball inside to start the game off. And they capped off that first inning by finishing it with a slider outside against Guerrero. Does the same thing with Shaw, except his slider breaks in against the lefty. So instead of trying to go outside and back door, he comes right inside and jams Shaw enough that he swings and misses right through it. Tasker Hernandez at the plate now, and a nice 3 0 count. Hernandez not getting into the lineup quite as much. Had himself a day off in Baltimore. One for eight in that series, so pretty quiet. He's been quiet recently as well. His average now right around 200. So 3-1, one away to Hernandez, and he'll take from ball four. So Hernandez walks with one out here. It brings up Brady Telez back at first base. And you know what? He's been pretty good to start off this year uh, after he got called up. Well, just limited sample size. Just over this past road trip, we saw him. This will be his first at-bat at home in 2020. Returns to the Rogers Center. He missed the first couple home stands. He was down in Buffalo getting some time there while the Jays had Fisher up instead. But Riley Telez back with the team now, and yeah, hard to complain with what he's given you so far in 2020. And that pitch you just saw him swing and miss on, that's the kind of pitch he wants. You know, part of the play, it's a fastball, and he had a chance to drill it deep and pull that. His first game in 2020 here at Rogers Center, of course. The 0-2 fouled off. And he's had lots of action at first base as well. Gets back in today as the defense continues to shift around for the Jays. Nothing is set. Everything is in motion with Montoya. I don't think it's good. You give Telez an opportunity to show what he can do with his glove. And been rather effective so far. The 0-2. 
the big first baseman swung on and missed on that outside pitch. Two away now. And the strikeout is something that Walden's got working early tonight and something he's shown against the Jays uh, in both of his first two starts. You combine the two, pitched eight and a third, striking out ten. So for a starting pitcher that's you know, not necessarily in his comfort zone starting games in 2020. He's looked good so far in that respect. So two out and a runner on first for Bo Bichette, who, you know, when we left for the road trip, through, it was a conversation of, you know, is this guy going to figure it out? What's wrong with him? You know, he'd been hitting around 120. And now average up a little bit, but not so much the average. Just the way he hit in Baltimore... Which gives you some signs for positive, for optimism, I guess you could say. Yeah, I mean, he's moved around the lineup as a result of needing something different here. And he's been staying down in the bottom of the past couple of games. It worked out in Baltimore. A big double scored a run that, you know, meant a lot in those low-scoring games. But he's going to have to work quite a bit to get his average and get his numbers back up to a point where he wants them. The 155 average he carries into this game is largely because of how deep he dug himself over those first few weeks. 3 1 to the shortstop. Taken. The cutter just grazes the bottom part of the zone. Full count, two out. Hernandez will be off on the throw. On the pitch, rather. As that one's grounded over to the second baseman, Chavis. To his left, he makes the play to retire Bichette, get the third out of this inning. So. A one out walk to no avail for the Blue Jays. It's still 1 0 Boston here at Rogers Center. Take a look now at what the Blue Jays pitching staff has done so far in 2020 and some really impressive numbers pretty much right across the board. The strikeout rate isn't the lowest one and that's because the Jays whole staff philosophy, especially in their starting rotation, is pitching to soft contact. Chase Anderson, who's on the mound tonight, is one of the better guys in that rotation to be doing it and that's one of the reasons that the success he's had in, career, in his career uh, where that success has come from. Back in 2017, he was in the top 3% in baseball in soft contact rate. He had an ERA of 274. And the fact that the Jays are, you know, in the top three in ERA is a lot because of the fact that Rourke and Chase Anderson and Ryu are guys that'll get those ground balls. Here's a guy who just hit a ground ball in his first plate appearance. It's Andrew Benatendi, who grounded out right in front of the catcher. To lead off the game. Two one count to the left fielder. As he fouls that one off, evens up the count at two now. And yeah, the pitching's been excellent for the Jays. The rotation, their bullpen. You're gonna have some shaky starts, as every single team does. But yeah, there's a clear motive for the front office for the Jays this year. As that one misses, gets away from Jansen. Full count. Yeah, they wanted to go and add some arms. They added Ryu, Roark, Anderson. Bring Shoemaker back. That way you can move a guy like Thornton down a little bit and let these young guys like Wogsback and Pearson develop a little more at AAA, albeit probably ready to go, some of them. And don't forget, these arms, especially a guy like Chase Anderson with a good contract, tradable. I <laughs> think that's possibly one of the biggest reasons they brought him in. And at the very least, a guy you can count on to some extent for reliable innings and consistency. And the issue with guys like Anderson, and even if you look back at what Shoemaker's had happened to him in his career, it hasn't necessarily been that they've struggled with underperformance, like a, maybe like a guy like Travis Shaw, for example, where he just had an off year. What's been hurting them throughout their career mostly has just been their inability to stay healthy. 
And so you sign a handful of older guys and you have a very reliable depth tier. You mentioned Wogs back, you met a few other guys down there that can come up in case of injury. The Jays kind of protect themselves on all angles. Guys that have been good when they're healthy and guys that can step in if they aren't healthy. So overall, it looks like this offseason, you know, maybe not the flashiest outside of signing Ryu. Maybe Tanner Roark isn't really going to light up the front page of a newspaper. But you look at what this front office has done, and it's pretty impressive. As that one sprayed down the left field line, that'll bounce fair. Biggio there to field it. So runners now at first and second. A good job by Biggio getting to that one quickly. As he was actually in the shift, had to run out from it with that ball right down the left field line. And what's so important of him getting there quickly, hard to tell if it would have for sure, but that looked like that might have bounced right up and over that wall. So no ground rule double. He gets to it before it does, keeps it to a long single. And now there's only one batter in scoring position instead of two, and the ground ball double play is still a possibility. So Benintendi at second, Devers at first. And J.D. Martinez, the DH, at the plate in the 1-1 count. He flew out to center in his first plate appearance. That one taken, ball two. J.D., a guy who's moved around, of course, in his career. Changed up his style a little bit when he went to Detroit, and it really worked for him. He's never looked back. A good first two years in Boston. And primarily a DH at this point in his career, especially with the way this Red Sox outfield, as we've seen this season, is constructed with Bradley Jr., Pilar, and Ben Attendi, assuming the everyday roles. And now he's in quite the good count here, 3-1 as Anderson looks to work around first and second, nobody out. That one's driven in a deep left field. Biggio looks like he's got a read on it. Makes the play and does a really good job of holding Benintendi at second, so one away now. And that ball was very loud off the bat. Martinez made solid contact with that one, lifted it high and deep, but not quite deep enough. And he's a guy that the Jays have done a real good job keeping relatively quiet so far. The, this past series where he visited Fenway, he was just 2 for 12. And the Jays have really shut down what's a very loud bat in almost every series he's played in. So it's Xander Bogarts popped up into foul territory back in the first to end the inning. He's been hot in his last 10, hitting well over 300, and now he's got a chance here. A runner in scoring position. A couple runners in the path to do some more damage as the Red Sox already struck in the last inning off an RBA double from Kevin Pillar. The 2-1 to the shortstop Bogarts misses away. So now 3-1, a nice hitter's count. Once again, Anderson falling behind a batter at the plate. The 3-1 taken low for ball four. So that'll juice the bases with one away here in the third for Mitch Moreland, power hitting lefty. And so now not only a walk in every inning, with the walk to Benintendi at the top of this inning and now to Bogarts. That's four walks through just two and a third for Chase Anderson and probably something that Pete Walker is keeping a very close eye on in that Chase dugout. This is inside ball one. Yeah, we're just seeing him not quite being able to command those pitches today, not getting many calls, but the, the off-speed low was working for him early. He's been able to go back to it too much. And now falling behind 2-0 here to the first baseman. Moreland 1 for 12 with a home run in the past series against Toronto. So that one hit, yeah, pretty effective one. <laughs> and Anderson already in another 3-0 count after the walk to Moreland. Jay's playing infield in, trying to cut down the runner at the plate if 
goes up the ground ball in play. 3-0 to Moreland, taken. Strike one right up the middle. And this one is ripped down to the first base side. Telez is able to stop it, field and make the play to first. But a run scores and the runners also advance. And I'm sure if Telez had come up with this cleanly, the, he, the throw would have been coming home and they might have had a chance to double up Moreland at first base. Instead, it's hit just a little too hard and Telez has to settle for one out. So for Anderson, he's now got two outs in this inning, but now there's already two runs in for Boston. So Benintendi scores on that ground up from Moreland. So one run in this inning, one run in the last. And we'll see if Anderson can stop the bleeding a little bit against Michael Chavis, who struck out in the second. And just one hit allowed in this inning. It's been the two walks that he gave up that have really come back to hurt him so far. Well, next you can see the pitch count already up at 27. 16 balls thrown, more balls than strikes. See another one there now, ball two to Chavis. And that one's fouled off, so we're leaving up the count at two now. And yeah, Anderson already up to 69 pitches. So this will most likely be a shorter end for him. Let's see if he can get it back on the rails here with two away. And the four walks allowed match his first 18 innings of work this season. It took him 18 innings to rack up his fourth walk of the season. Here it's only taken him two and two thirds. So full count. So that one misses low. Two strikes. Three balls. And Chavis strikes out. Much needed one for Anderson. He yanks the string on him with the off speed pitch. So. Red Sox add another run, and it's 2 0 here in Toronto with McGuire Biggio Jansen looking to strike. Welcome back to Toronto on the Virtual Jays Network. My name is Jackson Farrow. I'm joined by Drew Frank here at Rogers Center. It's the Blue Jays' first game back from their nine-game roadie. And they're down 2 nothing here. Chase Anderson's had a little bit of trouble. A lot of run in the second. Another run just now in the third. So we'll see now if this Blue Jays team can get their own offense going a little bit. It's been quiet so far as McGuire flies out to center. Doesn't take long to retire McGuire. He had quite a day yesterday, picked up a pair of base hits, including an RBI single in the seventh inning where he came up with two away and poked one up the middle into center field to drive home to Les and eventually, in what was just a 2-1 game, that was the winning run. So here's Kevin Biggio, 0 for 1. He's gone cold as of late as we talked about, but in left field today there was that one play where Pilar, the RBI double, in the second, it was, it was a gapper, and it looked ugly, I think, on Biggio because he outstretched his arm, he was running, he was trying to get over there, and it just kind of sails past his outstretched arm. Looks a little awkward, he goes, Grichik actually fields it for him uh, as Biggio walks here, but then makes a really good play in the last inning to keep the runners at first and second off a double, because he was able to snag it with that long arm of his, so he was bouncing, potentially, uh, you know, could have given more bases. Now, regardless, the Red Sox are able to score that inning, but Vizio trying to redeem himself a little bit. Obviously, an infielder playing in the outfield is subject to lots of scrutiny. But And still early in the season, he's still working on learning that outfield position. He's picked it up throughout the spring. We saw him a little bit last year, and there's going to be lots of time for improvement, but 
you know, there's bigger mistakes to make than a ball that I'm not even sure if the starting left fielder Lourdes Gurriel would have gotten to because that ball, like I said, looked like it might have had double all over it written right off of the bat when Pilar hit that one. So hard to tell, but yeah, a nice play to recover and, and prevent the ground rule double later on. So mixed results from Biggio, but not the end of the world by any means. So we need a hit. You call on Danny Jansen recently. He's had a couple late home runs in the Baltimore series, hitting 288 on the year. No gloves and doesn't need him. He's been looking great this year at the plate and behind the plate as well. Arguably the Jays' best position player so far. 2 2 fouled up. And for Walden here, the big part of this is keeping that pitch count low. You look at his opponent, Anderson, whose count is now into the 70s. It's an opportunity for this Red Sox team to preserve the bullpen any way they can. You just got to keep that count low so that bullpen doesn't get worked too much. I'd say the same about the Jays, although their bullpen is already well rested, having not been uh, too, uh, too used very often in Baltimore. Full count to Jansen. Foul it off. We see him battling here. And both teams, you mentioned the bullpens, they'll have the day off on Thursday. For the Red Sox, it's because they travel back home to host Texas. For the Jays, just a day of the rest, so the bullpens will get that recovery time. As that one's flown into center field, Bradley Jr. gets underneath it, so two away now. And Walden comes out on top in that battle. Jansen held 0 for 7 in his time at Fenway Park. He played in two of those three games. The one game he sat out was the Reese McGuire heroics with the late inning home run, but outside of that series, Jansen's been quite consistent. So it's Gritchick. Steps in, takes first pitch strike with two away. Still a runner on first. It's Kevin Biggio. And that pitch, that slider just... Sneaks into the bottom part of the zone. Quickly 0-2 here to Gritch. And that one misses inside. And with Gritchick, it's... I, d defensively, he's taken on more responsibility at the plate. He's taken on more responsibility this year. And you know what? He's thrived for the most part. A couple shady plays in center. But for the most part, he's been very effective on a young team. 1-2, flown out in the left center. Bradley Jr. has got a long way to go. He's back at the track, and it's gone. Randall Gritschuk ties this one up with one swing of the bat, his fourth of the season. 2-2 here in Toronto. And in the same way the Red Sox got their first run on the board, it was just a walk and an extra base hit, and the same thing here for Walden. That's the first hit he surrendered this game, and now he's trailing or not trailing, sorry, now he surrendered two runs and just one hit allowed because it's not necessarily what but when as the walk sets up this home run nicely as Gritchick picks up two RBIs on this ball. Man, how many times have we seen him pull a home run ball just like that into left center field so far this season already? Beautiful swing, sounded good off the bat, looks even better when it's going over the wall. Ties things up for the Jays, this crowd's moving now. So Guerrero Jr. steps in. He can hit a home run or two if he wants. And we'll see what he can do to follow that up as he grounds that one over to the shortstop side. Bogart's deep in the hole. will try the throw. And to no avail as Moreland wasn't able to catch that. I think Guerrero Jr. would have been safe regardless, but he reaches on an infield single. Yeah, it looked like he was set to beat that one out. Very tough play for Bogart's because he was playing deep already. He knows... Guerrero doesn't have a lot of speed, so he doesn't have to play too shallow to worry about Guerrero getting hit on anything in front of him. And then he had to range to his right and still backing up to even get to that. He was about 10 feet out of the end of the dirt into the grass when he fielded that, tried to stop his momentum and throw. And to his credit, made it a close play at first, but just very, very difficult and wasn't able to pull it out. So Travis Shaw now struck out in the second. He quickly 0-2 here.
And then that bat from Grichuk, just going back a little bit. What I noticed, he got down two strikes very quickly. And the fact that he was able to battle and work and still see those pitches and not be afraid to try to launch one and potentially have a big whiff. We've seen Grichuk, he's known to have a high strikeout rate. And he's had that this year as well. But you know, taking those risks and sometimes paying off. And Shaw strikes out. So that'll end the inning, but not before Randall Grichuk ties this thing up with one swing of the bat. A big two-run shot. And we got ourselves a tie ball game as we head to the fourth here on the virtual Jays Network. Welcome back to Toronto. Welcome back to Jays as well. They've returned from a road trip. And so it'll be Christian Vasquez for the Red Sox up next. Vasquez, Pilar, Bradley Jr., 79 hitter for the Sox. As we see Shin Yamaguchi and Wilmer Font starting to get loose. No surprises there with Chase Anderson's pitch count in the 70s. And those will be the two guys Montoyo looks to when he needs more than one inning. And as you mentioned, just in the fourth, already with the pitch count that high, that might just be the case here unless Anderson can buckle down and give a couple good innings and maybe it really follows suit from what we saw from Tanner Roark where his pitch count was up. We are debating whether or not we'd see him come out for another inning and then he came out for two good more innings where he got six up, six down. Absolutely. We'll see if Anderson can channel some of that passion. And that, uh, I guess that bravado a little bit to have been struggling, but go out there, just get the job done. Being able to battle back, persevere, if you will. He needs to do that here. He's got some run support now, though, of course, with that two-run shot from Gritchick. And let's say all things are equal. With Yamaguchi and Font in the pen, if Anderson runs into some trouble, I mean, they're both righties. Where is We've seen Yamaguchi more, but why? Why is that the case? I think it looks like Montoya's got a little more trust in Yamaguchi right now for going multiple innings without really allowing too many runs. So maybe if there's some more scratches on the, the board there for Boston and he wants a guy that can keep it close over a couple innings, and not burn the whole bullpen, it'll be Yamaguchi. But I think we'd see Font if this game stays tied because Font came in in relief with the lead, a little bit of a higher leverage spot. So it's almost like Montoyo likes Yamaguchi for those longer outings to just give solid innings, but might go the Font if the stakes are a little bit higher, if this game's tied or the Jays pull up a lead in the next half inning or so. Kevin Pillar steps in, and the last time he was at the plate, well, he hit himself a two-out RBI double that drove home the first run of this ballgame. As he swings on that one, grounds it up the middle. So Kevin Pillar, two for two today. And a one-out single now as Bradley Jr. will step in. And Pilar firmly near the top of that leaderboard despite batting down in the lineup. That's his 26th hit. Sorry, that's his 28th hit, which will vault him all the way up to third place behind just the big bats of Bogarts and J.D. Martinez. And that'll chase Anderson here early in this game. Pardon the pun that will chase Chase Anderson. Couldn't have said it better myself, Drew. And so Anderson's day, uh, not the best. His pitch count got high early. Got into some trouble with a lot of walks. Your attention, please. And it'll be the man himself, Shun Yamaguchi, back in. One of Montoya's favorites out of the pen. And expect to see him finish this fourth and come out probably for the fifth and maybe even the sixth based on how he's been deployed this year. Not shying away from multiple innings and 
any case in as much as three innings we've seen in the past. Bradley Jr. takes him to deep right, his first pitch, but Hernandez is there to make the play, so quickly two away here. And three and a third today for Chase Anderson. Not the start that he wanted. Clearly Boston's got his number a little bit. It was three runs on three innings in his last at at time out. Here it's two runs on three and a third. A far cry from a quality start. As that one's grounded through the gap between shortstop and third. So Benintendi reaches. Now runners at first and second. A little bit of trouble now as it'll bring up the heart of this order. Devers is a guy that throughout his career has really hit well at Rogers Center. He hits well all over the place, but at Rogers Center he's got eight home runs in 87 at-bats, hitting 333 here on the year. Flies that one to deep center. Gritchick ranging back. He's at the track. Makes the play. So Devers tries to go deep, almost does. But it stays in the yard this time. So six, seven, eight hitters up for the Jays. As we head to the bottom of the fourth in Toronto. Welcome back to Toronto here at Rogers Center. A month into the season now. Things are well underway. It's great to have you with us in the Virtual Jays Network. Jackson Farrow and Drew Frank in the booth enjoying this one. It's been a tie game here now. And if you're just joining us, Kevin Pillar had himself an RBA double in the second. Gave the Red Sox a run. And then in the third, Moreland ground out to first and drove in a run after... Devers and Bogarts were able to reach. And, and Randall Grinchuk ties things up. One swing of the bat. A two-run shot to left center. And so here we are. It's two all. Bottom of the fourth. Walden's still in as his pitch count now in the 70s. And the Red Sox already with Perez warming up. Starting last inning. And he's their version of Yamaguchi in a sense. He'll come in almost regardless of the score. Whether it's close. Whether it's mop-up duties and a guy that will give you up to three innings of relief. Nice way to bridge the gap between the starter and the back end of that bullpen. 2-2 Two -two to Hernandez, swung on, and grounded over the third. Devers reaches out and makes the play. And it's in time for the out. So next, they'll be Rowdy Telez coming up in the eighth hole. He struck out in his first that bat. It was a slider in on the inner half of the plate. That he just couldn't get a piece of. And we talked about the, su the success Telez had over the road trip. You know, the strikeouts are going to come with that. It, we've, we talked to, I think the biggest example we talked about was Mike Zanino over this road trip of a guy that the Rays manager, Kevin Cash, puts in the lineup looking for those home runs and just you accept the strikeouts if they come. And that's kind of been Rowdy Telez at least so far in his young career. And definitely maybe some vision or discipline skills he can work on a little bit to try and reduce the Ks, but thus far that's kind of a part of who he's been. 21 home runs last year in 54 RBI. 3-0 to the first baseman. He flies it out in the left center. Benintendi underneath it. And he'll easily make the play. Uh, if I'm Telez there, if I'm Montoyo better yet, why let him swing on 3-0? I like the decision. I mean, you got a 3 0 count with a guy, a power bat with no one on base. You've got 8 9 1 after, after behind you with already an out in the inning. A pitcher that's nearing his upper end of the pitch count, why not? If you see something you want to hit, and you've got the lefty platoon matchup at the plate, I'm giving him that green light all day. So he flies out to left, and it'll be Bo Bichette. At the play, he drives one in the left field, but Benintendi right there 
to make the play hard hit, but just not quite long enough. So three up, three down quickly here for Walden in the fourth, and it's still tied as we head to the fifth in Toronto. Welcome back to Toronto. It's 2 2 as we start the fifth inning here. Shun Yamaguchi back out. He finished things off uh, in the fourth, relieving Chase Anderson, who was only able to go three and a third. And he'll have a full clean inning to work with. And no easy part of the lineup to try and navigate through. It's 3 4 5. JD Martinez with Bogarts on deck, and behind him, Mitch Moreland's. No easy task, but Yamaguchi's seen them all so far this year. As that one's flowing into center field, Gritchuk takes a couple steps forward and makes the play. And it's that kind of work that makes you wonder, you know, these Sabre metrics and the analytics say maybe what Yamaguchi's doing isn't going to be quite sustainable. Giving up a big fly ball to a guy like J.D. Martinez who's got power, got Devers to fly out last inning to center field who's got power, and you wonder if it's really only a matter of time until Yamaguchi starts getting bit a little more by the home run with all the fly balls, with all the fly balls he induces. A lot of big one to Joey Votto back when Cincinnati was in town a couple weeks ago. And yeah, two hard outs, Bradley Jr. and Devers last inning to the outfield and now one there. Bogart's in a 1-0 count now, takes away for ball two. And Bogarts has really got a hot streak coming into this one. He's 0 for 1 with a walk today. As he drills that one in the left, Biggio ranging back at the track and makes the play. Well, 0 for 2 now today, but coming into the game, 13 for his last 33, including three home runs over his last 10 games. One of the reasons that the Red Sox have stayed competitive and been close in a lot of these games despite the pitching staff not quite getting it done for them. Mitch Moreland now at the plate. Ranked second on the Red Sox with 16 RBI. Been hitting in the five hole for most of the season. Drives one now to right center. Gritchuk giving chase and that one's off the wall. So Moreland will cruise in a second with a two-out double here. And I guess all's well that ends well so far this inning. Two big fly balls to Martinez and Bogarts are both retired for fly balls, especially the Bogarts one. Looked like it might have had a chance to get out. But now the third fly ball of the inning, Moreland. Lucky for Yamaguchi, it stays in the park, but as it bounces off the warning track, it's an easy stand-up double for Moreland, who's now in scoring position with two away. And if you're concerned about Yamaguchi allowing the long ball, and this is the lineup that can hit the long ball. You've got Devers, Martinez, Bogarts, Moreland, even Vasquez, even this guy, Michael Chavis, all capable of hitting the long ball, especially in a park like this, too. The Rogers said a bit of a boom box. But a chance with two out to ensure that no damage is really done. 2-1 to Chavis, who has two strikeouts on the day. Swings on that one, grounds it up the third base side. It's going to be fair. Rayo Jr. from the foul territory makes the big throw, but it's not in time. A good effort regardless. So runners in the corners now as Chavis reaches. And with that ball staying in fair territory, more important than the fact that he tried to make the out there at first base was the fact that he got to that and kept it on the infield. Running on contact was Moreland from second base. If that gets past him down the line, he should be able to score easily. So back-to-back -back base hits. And Moreland to third. Chavis at first. And Vasquez at the plate in a one count. 
He's 0 for 1 with a walk. And a real good opportunity to cash in some more runs for these Red Sox as they try to get the lead back. 1-1 misses outside, but Vasquez swings late there. So that curveball, he saw something you like late. And he goes, so now 1-2. Big pitch there. And then he strikes out. So Vasquez, not an ideal at bat with runners on the corners. And Yamaguchi's able to escape. We're still tied here in Toronto. So the Red Sox make the call to the bullpen. Marcus Walden's day is done and it'll be Martin Perez sporting a 9.39 ERA. And his last appearance was with the Red Sox on their trip to Minnesota in the Friday game. It was a game that they lost 13 to eight. And he came in after Colin McHugh could only go an inning and two thirds. Martin, Mar Martin Perez inherited a deficit five to three, but then he surrendered six runs on four hits and three walks and eventually the deficit grew even larger with with his contributions the game as a whole Boston gave up 13 runs but the more fascinating part 12 hits 11 walks surrendered as it was free passes all day long from that Boston staff yeah but Perez especially though has really struggled this year and you know, he got lit up in that opening series against the Jays. And very important uh, situation now for Perez, though. Tie ball game. You're only in the fifth. Ain't no life raft coming for you here. You've, you're Perez, I mean, you're a little relief. You're looking at fifth, possibly two, maybe even three innings of work if it goes well. And he starts off with a walk to the DH McGuire. Now we mentioned the walks were a major problem for him and the Red Sox. On Friday night, he comes in here, faces 9-1-2. One of the last things you want to do is walk the nine hitter, especially when you've got the lefty on lefty advantage against a lefty hitter, McGuire, that doesn't necessarily hit all that well. And he's taking all the way 3-0, gives you a free strike, and then you miss the zone in a five-pitch walk. Tough start for press. So Biggio steps in, takes strike one. And we see, you know, it's interesting, McGuire, the DH catcher, rather, yesterday, and makes a big play, you know, the RBI single back in the seventh. Jansen was the DH. Now they flip-flop, seeing lots of these catchers get into games for the Jays. Their bats are both vital. And with McGuire on the path, Biggio flies out, so one away for the other catcher, Danny Jansen. And McGuire not only contributed to the win by hitting that RBI single, he actually finished off the win and not catching the final strike on a strikeout. He actually threw out the final out on a caught stealing at second base. Not the way you see a lot of games end, but the Orioles down by one, tried to get that tying run 90 feet closer, running from first to second, but McGuire gunned him out and that was the final out for the game. Those throws to first after that strikeout, especially you know, when, the, when the game is hanging in the balance like it was. Like, I've never caught Drew, but I, I can't imagine that that play must be very fun to do, especially just all the mind tricks going on. Is that one? They sit down in the left field, so it'll be a base hit back. So Jansen reaches the McGuire at second, Jansen at first, and. That'll bring up Brandon Gritchuk, who had a two-run shot his last time up. We've got the runners on the base paths now. Starts off with a strike. And 
And here's a guy who's hitting for average right now. He's been hitting well. He's been hitting for some power. Back in the three hole, as I was talking about during the last at bat, really shouldering lots of responsibilities. That one is hit over to second. Play to second for one, and then back to first. Richick is safe, so. McGuire is able to advance here to third, but Richick delivers a shot that could have gone through the gap there, but Chavis a really good job to field that. And great work by Chavis. You're not gonna be able to turn a double play on that, but they made it quite close. More importantly, they get the out at second for sure. And that was a ball you mentioned. Hit into a difficult spot. Could have very realistically been everyone ending up safe, but they get the runner at second. And now a sack fly won't score a run because they've got two away for Vlad. As he drills that one into the stands. Oh, look out. Hitting 316 with runners in scoring position this season. The chance here with the runner 90 feet away to take the lead. That one inside. The man you want the play for sure. And a single in his last time up. So takes inside, now ball two. As Perez looks to escape without allowing any damage, similar to his counterpart Yamaguchi. As that one's hit to short, Bogarts flips to second in time for the force out. So, as the Blue Jays' damage looms, but they're unable to cash in any of those runs. They leave a couple runners on the bases. Still tied here in Toronto. Kevin Pillar steps in now, and we welcome you back to start off the sixth inning here at Rogers Center on the virtual Jays Network. The 2-2 game, both teams had chances to score in the fifth inning off of the relievers, Yamaguchi and Perez, but neither team able to finish the job and cash in those runs, so we're still tied, and now both bullpens should get working even harder now than they already were. The Amiguchi out for his second inning of what, or I guess you could say his third inning as he finished off the fourth, worked through the fifth, and here he is in the sixth. Just 21 pitches. And both teams have opportunities. Toronto, you figure, had a maybe a bit of a better opportunity. The leadoff walk to the nine hitter. The top of the order came up, and they weren't able to bring him around past third base. Stranded there, 90 feet away from taking the lead, but stranded all the same as this game still tied now into the sixth. 3-0 to Pilar, taken for a strike. Pilar, two for two in the day. He looked excellent. Double and a single, and now he's got, as he hits that one over to short, Bichette, deep in the hole, makes the play. Some great defense by the young shortstop, Bo Bichette, ranging to his right. <laughs> Very impressive play. Bichette retires the first out of the inning, and he talked about the Jays had runners on the base paths this past inning, right from the start as the leadoff runner reached. Here, a beautiful play with the glove from Bichette at short prevents the same thing from happening for these Red Sox, and now there's one out as they'll be the nine hitter trying to spark something here. And I was just saying how Pilar was two for two and was about to be three for three before Bichette made that incredible play. So Pilar has retired. Bradley Jr. in a 2-0 count now. Had a deep fly out to right in the fourth. Yeah. 
Gets a strike call there. Yamaguchi does to get back in the count. Bradley Jr., free agent at season's end. 30 years old now. Very useful to, I'm sure, pretty much every ball club in Major League Baseball would like to get their hands on. Left-handed hitter. Can hit pretty well for you. Get some good contact. And, of course, the defense out in center. Lots to like. 3-1, the number nine hitter, Bradley Jr. Taken. And fourth ball sneaks in there, so a full count now. And the payoff gets Bradley Jr. A swing and a miss, so a strikeout. Now, and... His first on the day, Bradley Jr. And the strikeout is just a, a fastball. He challenges him in the upper half of the zone, right up near the letters. He gets that fastball up around 94, which is a big difference from the cutter that sits around 89 and the curveball that gets all the way down as low as, I think, 66 is the slowest we've seen him throw it this year, which is a big drop off from 94, 95. Certainly is. And I really like the call by Jansen and Yamaguchi there to challenge Bradley Jr. with full count, in effect. That one is falling to the left. Biggio makes the play, so quickly three up, three down for Yamaguchi here in the sixth. And we'll head to the bottom half of the inning as the Jays look to take the lead here in Toronto. Welcome back to Toronto. We'll see Travis Shaw lead things off in the bottom half of the sixth for the Jays, as he did in the second. He struck out twice, both swinging now today. So Perez now out there for another inning of work. The Jays put some pressure on him and had a chance to drive in some runs. The had McGuire 90 feet away, over there at third with two away, but Guerrero Jr. was able to do it, unable to do anything with it. But with two lefties out there, Perez goes back out. Two lefties coming up, I should say, in Shaw and Telez, of course. And two lefties that can do damage with one swing of the bat and tie this, and sorry, untie this game real quickly with one swing. As Shaw takes high, so two balls, two strikes. Hitting fifth in the lineup today. Grounds that one over to first. Moreland ranging over and beats him to the bag for one, for the first out of this inning here. And a nice grab by Moreland on the backhand. Ranges to his right, plants his feet, and heads back to first. And you might think that that's kind of an insignificant play. He doesn't have to throw it, doesn't have to receive a throw from an infield or scoop it, but when Shaw pulls that ball, that's a chopper that's coming at Moreland hard and can take a tough bounce off of the grass or off of the dirt. He stays with it, ranges over, and it's fundamental, sure, but those are the fundamental plays you gotta make. Moreland, the 34-year-old, gold glover in his time. He's used to playing some good defense at first. As that one is ground past the second baseman, Chavis, for a base hit. Hernandez reaches for the second time today. And Teoscar Hernandez has really struggled of late. One for his last 11 with five strikeouts coming into today. He turns that around. Already two hits tonight. That's more than the past five games for him. Yeah, he's reached base twice. He's got himself a single now. Also walked in the second. So correction, that ties his last five games with the single right there then. There you go. And Rowdy Telez at the plate now. 
Swings on that inside pitch. Quickly 0-2 here as that one's foul. And after the leadoff walk to McGuire, you can see Perez is really attacked here now in his second inning of work, bouncing back from that. I got to count one and two. That one misses low. And Perez here, kind of first and one away, trying to continue this middle relief outing that's gone well, okay so far. He's kept this game tied. I think that's his main goal here, as that one's fouled off. has a strikeout and a flyout already today. And he strikes out there. So two strikeouts on the day for Telez. And now 0 for 3. And Perez's first strikeout on the day as well. It'll be interesting to see now that he's gotten those two lefties out, whether or not Renneke leaves him in the game for much longer. Bobashek coming up next. Hits lefties a little better, but with just a runner on first, not much danger necessarily. And with two outs, you can afford to roll the dice with him as behind Bichette. Guess what? There's two more lefties. Outside, that's the ball. A much more balanced lineup today for the Jays. So it's Bo Bichette now at the plate and takes ball one. He's 0 for 2 in the day. No, he's safe. As Hernandez has to slide back to first on the Pickoff attempt and Perez looking to, as I said, escape this inning. Although it's been a pretty effective one for him. He's going to strike out onto Les and a shot of ground out. Not too much hard contact noticed yet off of Perez for these Jays as Bichette grounds that one up the middle. And what a play by Chavis to get that one and flip it to short. So it'll be Devers, Martinez, Bogarts, and the last part of that sixth inning craziness is Bichette hits a ball right up to second baseman Chavis. With lots going on at second as Hernandez was trying to slide in on while Chavis trying to field the ball right beside him. It was a really good play by Chavis. Fields quickly flips, and I mean quickly flips, all in one motion really for the shortstop Bogarts at second. It was a really good defensive play. And ends the inning there after having Hernandez on first base. And, you know, if that ball finds a way to squeak through and Bichette reaches, that would give some trouble as the bottom of the order with McGuire around back to the top has been producing for the Jays lately. But not only does Chavis keep that on the infield, gets it for an out and ends the inning. So Devers grounds out. Devers, who you know, kind of a top prospect all the way through. And one of the better ones the Red Sox have had in a few years. Speaking of top prospects, Drew, what's the farm system looking like for the Jays as their seasons have kind of kicked off here? Well, on the pitching side, you want to talk top prospects? How about Nate Pearson? Starting off in AAA this year, he's 3-1, and, and through 26 innings, he's got 31 strikeouts with a 2-4-2 ERA, looking very sharp. His rotation mate, TJ Zoik, is also really starting off strong. He's 3-0. and with a 1.8 ERA through 20 innings. And the third arm to keep an eye out, so far at least, has been Alec Manoa down in Double A, who's 3-0 and as well, with a 1.96 ERA through 23 innings. So progression shown for all three guys, and we saw a little bit of Zoic up at the end of the year last year, when the Jays were desperate in September, but a few arms we probably won't see at least for a while as they continue to develop down there. And a couple first rounders in there as well, and Zoic and Manoa. So some pitching on the way for the Jays. And it gets back into that conversation about these older arms potentially getting moved to the deadline to make room. But we'll have to wait and see some good starts, though, from those fellas. 
keep an eye on them as the season goes on. So Martinez walks. It'll be Xander Bogart to the plate, one on, one out. Still a tie game here in the seventh. Bogarts has reached once in his three at-bats so far, or should I say in his three plate appearances so far. His second appearance wasn't in that bad. He walked and contributed to loading the bases back in the third inning. He didn't get further than second base as the Red Sox only cashed in one run there, but in a tie game, of course, every run you get matters. And he helped keep that rally going as he came on with two out and one on and didn't get a big base hit, but a walk's just as good of his hit, and he kept the inning going before they cashed in. So Guerrero Jr. there to make the play. So Bogart's retired. He stung that ball. He made solid contact. Guerrero, not much time to react at all, but reaches up and makes a fine grab there. Great angle from our camera team as well, but yes, an excellent grab. Good reaction from Guerrero Jr. at that hot corner as well. So two away from Mitch Moreland, who himself made a good defensive play in this game. He's made a bunch in his career, of course. Going to go Glover, for the All-Star, going to Texas Ranger. This is his 10th season in the bigs now. Sure doesn't feel like it, but this decade moves quick when you're having fun, right? Well, Moreland in a 2 -0 count. Moreland doubled off of Yamaguchi in his first at-bat. Pulled it right into the right center gap. It looked like off the bat it had a chance to leave the yard. Bounced up against the wall. It was a stand-up double, and he got stranded at third base a few batters later. As Moreland swings and misses, evens up the count at two now. Yamaguchi, if he can get this out, finish off this at bat, that would be, well, parts of three innings in relief would be two plus, but still. Very good job by Yamaguchi today if he can finish things off. Payoff to Moreland. Swing on and missed on a high pitch. It gets the lefty to go, so Yamaguchi keeps this thing all tied up. It's a tie ball game as we stretch here in Toronto. Hello, I want to welcome back to Toronto. We're going to see another pitching change for the Red Sox here. And Keith Hembry comes in. He's looked really good so far this season, and a lot of it comes from the one number you see is the strikeouts to walk ratio. 29 to 5 strikeouts to walks. A bit of a veteran pitcher. He knows his role in the, rota in, a, in the bullpen is to go and throw consistent quality innings, and that means not mess around too much. Sure, you mix in some balls for variety, but you're going to want to throw a lot of strikes and place the fastball effectively, and that's something he's done so far this year. Swung on and missed there. So a 1-1 count to Reese McGuire. Normally a catcher. Today he's DHing. Grabs that one over the second baseman. Chavis, he'll make the play. Well, to continue, our, our farm report as one catcher grounds out, and we've got another one now on deck. How about double-A catcher Riley Adams? Part of a tandem down there that's tearing up the double-A circuit. He's hitting 360 with four home runs already in just 50 at-bats in combination with Griffin Conine, who's hitting 322 with five homers and 16 RBIs in just 54 at-bats. Those two guys both relatively high draft picks. Adams chosen in the third round in 2017 and Conine's been in the system for a couple of years. And uh, the third name I, I just want to mention quickly here because Jays fans will know it, Jonathan Davis. 
Played a bit last year. Again, he's in AAA, hitting 309 in this young season, looking pretty good in center field for the Bisons again. He's got a pair of home runs and nine RBIs, but for him, it, the, it, there's been a lot of trouble with that jump from producing his AAA numbers how, as he has the same in the major leagues. So Biggio strikes out. Yeah, you mentioned some of those catchers, Drew. I mean, you've already, I think the Blue Jays at the major league level, their position of strength, you could argue, is catcher. With the way Reese McGuire and Danny Jansen have started this year and the way they've kind of come up together. But hey, some more on the way never hurts. You can move guys around. You've seen it today. So Danny Jansen. And even the fact that Jansen and McGuire are both so young, so they're not even covered right now, but next year, the year after, the year after that, they've they've got a future here at the catcher position that's already up and ready. So a 1-1 count to Jansen, who walked in the first, single in the fifth. Nope. Now here he is looking to try to break this thing open. He's had a couple clutch home, late home runs in games in the Baltimore series. We'll see if he can rekindle that magic this time, maybe. Two two scores two two, and there's two out as Jansen fouls that one with the seats. And Jansen's home run in the very first series. The late inning heroics in the eighth to take the lead was in a tie game against Boston. It was the bottom of the eighth. It was Ryan Brazier on the mound instead of Heath Embry, but a similar situation where he came up clutch and the game that was tied, his solo home run was the difference maker way back, if you remember, to our home opener in the end of March. Payoff to Jansen. Swung on, fouled up, so we see quite the battle. Once again for Jansen at the plate. And those heroics, one month to the day. <laughs> As that one is also drove foul. Of course, dude. This Blue Jays lineup, albeit young, certainly uh, has a couple home heroes on it. And more to come for sure as the years go by. As that one hit the second play is made. So... Jansen's retired quickly. Three up, three down here for Henry in the seventh. And we'll head now to the eighth. Still tied here in Toronto. Welcome back. So now we'll see another cog in this strong Blue Jays bullpen to start the year. It's Justin Miller. A sub-3 ERA from Miller. And you're seeing him now because they don't have the lead. In the past, when with the lead, we see Montoyo go the bass if the Jays are in front. And he'll come in as a setup man or this eighth, usually the eighth inning guy. Without the lead, it's Miller. And not in the mop-up role by any means. He's still getting high leverage situations just more of a bridge guy than a true back-end guy, and he's done that role really nicely for this Toronto team. In a very important spot here in the eighth. He'll look to keep this game tied against Chavis, Vasquez, and Pilar. Chavis a single in the fifth, but a couple strikeouts in the second and third. As the 0-1 is taken, just high. <clears throat> just high for ball one. And Miller facing the part of the order he wants to be facing. He just missed the danger of Mitch Moreland. And the one real blemish on Miller's season so far was against Boston back in game three of the season. He came in with a lead. It was the ninth inning. He was trying to close it out before needing to bring in Giles in the safe situation. He got hammered hard by a home run by Moreland that ended up his final line 
only being two-thirds of an inning pitched, allowing two runs on two hits, and that's really sunk his ERA from then on. So a full count of uh, Chavis now. Vasquez on deck because he takes that ball high. Payoff to the second baseman, taken low and inside. So Miller starts off issuing a leadoff walk here. This will be Christian Vasquez who himself walked back in the second. Actually came around to score in that inning as well. Off of a Kevin Pillar RBI double. One ball to the catch of Vasquez. As I mentioned earlier, he's kind of assumed more of a role with this team. No. Yeah, as he should. He's a really good hitter. And in fact, last season, let's see, he put up about 23 home runs and a nice 270, 276 average. Getting on base at a clip of 320. Uh, he's looking for a mistake over the heart of the plate right now. Miller misses high and inside with a slider that slipped out of his hands. Comes back with a fastball, a two-pitch pitch, or you can probably expect a fastball here. 2-1 count, he's geared up for it. This is low, so ball three now. Kevin Pilar on deck, Miller once again behind here. And if I'm Charlie Montoya, I'm not wasting any time getting another arm up in the pen. Leadoff walk, followed by falling behind 2-0. And the second pitch was a slider that missed really badly. Tie game, uh, the winning run already on first base, or leaving run, should I say. I, I wouldn't be messing around. Of course, you got to give Miller three batters with the new rule, but want to have someone ready in case things go south quickly. Perhaps a lefty as well with Bradley Jr. and Benintendi both coming up. As that one is shot in the left field, Vigio makes the play in front of the wall. So Vasquez is retired from a deep shot to left. Whew. Thought that one might be able to get out of here. That was loud off the bat, but just died. Didn't quite have the length, but as he hits that one out to left field, you can see right behind where Bizio is fielding that, Gavilio and Pannone are both throwing for Toronto. So Miller will get Pilar for sure, but then we'll have to see after that what Montoyo decides to do with this pen. One on, one out. A tie game here in the top of the eighth for Kevin Pillar, the man who drove in the first run of this game back in the second. He's two for three. And that one out was a beautiful play by Bo Bouchette. He really could have been three for three on the day if not for a, a true web gem out there at short. And a great pitch there by Miller. High offerings just catches the top part of the zone, evens up the count at one. Double play still in effect here. So not too much to worry about yet for Miller, but he keeps falling behind in these counts as these Red Sox, hitter, Red Sox hitters aren't swinging it much. 2-1 taken inside for ball three. And Miller continues to show a little bit of struggle with his control. He's thrown more balls than strikes so far this inning and working himself into some trouble here as this bomb of the order can do some damage if you put them in hitters counts as he's done so far. The 3-1 taken right on the inside part. The slider comes back in, so it's a full count. Huge pitch here, full count to Pilar, one out, one on, tie game. Fastball right up the middle is driven into right. Hernandez comes over, makes the play. So now two outs for Jackie Bradley Jr., the lefty. Now and Mid Miller settled down a little bit. But when he's only got two pitches, if one of them he's not feeling tonight, that'll get him in trouble really quickly. Some starters, you know, they'll tell you after a game that they weren't feeling, for example, their changeup wasn't quite on and they had to adjust their game plan because of it. If you're a reliever and you work on 1-2, bread and butter, fastball slider, if you're not feeling one of them in a certain night, it's, night could go south really quickly. 
As that one's sprayed in the left, Biggio ranges back, makes the play. So a leadoff walk, and Miller gets three flyouts to get through the eighth. Still a 2-2 game as we head to the bottom part of this inning now in Toronto. Welcome back. So we'll see Austin Bryce to kick things off in the bottom part of the eighth for the Red Sox here. And Bryce is a reliever that they've used in a couple different situations. We saw him at Fenway Park. A ready reliever that will work mostly fastball, curveball. He also throws a changeup, but he goes to the curveball more often than not when he's looking to mix speeds. So Gritcher gets himself a leadoff base hit. That one hit in the left. And the Jays here now quickly attacking Bryce. Gritchick coming up in a great spot here in the bottom of the eighth inning. This game is still tied, and now they've got the potential leading run on first base, trying to do something with it. And with the 3 4 5 hitters up now, I mean, you get a great opportunity with the heart of the order to break this game open. And now a runner at first. Talking small ball, now's the time. Although your big hitters are up, I bother. Guerrero Jr. quickly 0-2 as he fouls that one off. And... And that was a pitch he could really do something with. Fastball up at the top of the zone, sitting around 93, but not around in time on that one. one ball. That one's taken low from ball one. Guerrero Jr. already a single on this one back in the third. Very effective as of late. And I already mentioned earlier, but this season against Boston, eight for 19. Three home runs and three walks. 2-2 Two -two to the young slayer, Guerrero Jr. Checks his swing. And so it'll be ball three, now a full count. And a bit of a battle here as Guerrero gets a good look at everything Bryce offers. He's already seen the fastball at the top of the zone, at the bottom of the zone. He's seen the breaking ball. He's seen the change up, and now he's got a pretty good idea out of his hand what he's going to be seeing and what he can do with it. See what he gets here. The payoff. Swung on and missed. Bryce gets him on that outside pitch. A really effective pitch here. That breaking ball looked like it was maybe going to end up outside of the zone, but it probably could have been called either way as it hangs out just on the black of the plate. Generates the swing and miss from Guerrero, and that's a huge out to get without the runner advancing. Uh, so an excellent pitch by Bryce. Gets him first out of this inning. So it's Travis Shaw up now. Two strikeouts and a ground out in this one. Pretty quiet day for him. Not much defense either. Hasn't really been tested at second base. Had to switch gloves for this one. Go with the second baseman's mid. He hasn't had to break out all year. Really similar to his third base mid, just a little bit smaller. There's a lot of guys tend to choose a, a smaller glove for help turning those double plays. Strikes out swinging on the inside pitch. Throws his bat. A tough day for Shaw. Three strikeouts now. All of them swinging and all of them on the inner part of the plate. Three different pitches. First the slider in and low. Then it was the cutter from Walden up high that jammed him. Now it's the fastball that just beats him on the inner half. And yeah, you can see the frustration and you can see exactly where it's coming from. Blue Jays back home, of course, after that road trip. Five and four. A solid outing. Thank for them overall. We got some bats going. Guriel Jr., for example. Bichette started to heat up. Pitching was improved, especially in the Baltimore series. 
and there was all sorts of opportunity given to guys that usually wouldn't play as big a role. Part of that was the injury sustained to Brandon Drury, which is unfortunate for this Jays team. Guys like Alfred got in the lineup and weren't able to do too much with it. And neither is Hernandez here as he grounds it to the third baseman Devers who throws it to second for the force out. So it's 2-2 as we head to the ninth here in Toronto. So it'll be Thomas Pannone, the lefty, coming out of the Blue Jays' bullpen now in the ninth. And this makes perfect sense on paper. You've got Benintendi and Devers starting this inning off. A pair of lefties, so you bring out your lefty reliever, and hey, who knows, top of the ninth, this game's still tied. Pannone could give you a couple innings if you need it. Of course, he made some starts in his career. Starts off with a ball on the inside part. Benintendi swings on that, grounds it over to the shortstop, Bichette, who makes the play. One away now. Making quick work there. The infield for the Jays has looked good tonight. Mentioned that Shaw hasn't been tested much in the last half of the inning when he was at the plate. We were talking about it, but Bichette sure has. He made a great play earlier, and over at third base, Vladimir Guerrero, if you remember back a few innings ago, ran about 10 feet into foul territory to keep a ground ball in front of him, made a jumping throw and almost got the runner at first. Uh, didn't quite get him, but still, one of a couple nice plays from this Jays defense. Talking about this defense, they look good on that road trip we were just talking about as well. Again, taking, like you said in the last part of the inning, the last part of this game rather, taking advantage of those opportunities. It really helped some situations come to fruition, some better hitting, some good defense. As Devers singles to left, now one on. And that's a pitch that Pannone leaves up over the middle of the plate. And in a sense, in this tied game, he's almost lucky that was almost a, that was only a single. Finds right through the 5-6 hole as Devers going to get aboard, but leaving that fastball up above the knees, middle of the zone, could do a lot more damage than that. So is J.D. Martinez at the plate. And I think one thing that at least I've gathered out of the recent road trip is just how reliant these Jays are on the home run ball. Look at Jansen, the last couple of games in Baltimore, some huge shots that changed the game. Where a junior, a big shot in Boston to give them the lead, they never look back. And I think a lot of teams in Major League Baseball rely on the home run, but we're seeing that a lot of this offense that really hasn't had a whole lot else. And one of their best performers over that road trip was Travis Shaw. He had a home run. He had a double, a big sack fly against Boston. And even with all that, he's just two for his last 14 coming into this game because, like you said, the big factors have been the home run. As that one's driven into deep center, Gritchick at the track makes the play. So two retired now after the deep flat from Martinez. He's 0 for 4 in the day. And that's something he said right off the top of the game, that they have been able to neutralize Martinez. And that's not something <laughs> that's easy by any means in this park and in this league. Everyone knows it. I mean, this park specifically, you want to look at Rogers Center. It's one of 15 parks around the MLB that Martinez is hitting over 300 in. And that, of course, includes Boston and includes Detroit and includes Arizona, the three teams that he's called home over the past couple of years. Roger Center, no exception. Almost anywhere he goes, he's hit, but not so not so much tonight and not so much in the last series at Fenway either, where the Jays were able to keep him quiet. Sure are. Here's another quiet guy at the plate. Bogart's 0 for 3 with a walk today. Went 4 for 10 in the last series. A couple walks. Out of Aruba, 
and Fakhti. Signed a big contract, six years through 2025, the vesting option for 26. So he's in Boston long term. He is their shortstop. <clears throat> He's at a 2-2 count now, and a chance to put the Red Sox in front. Run around first. Swing and a miss. A strikeout on Bogarts there, so Pannone deals a scoreless inning. His bullpen's looking effective once again for the Jays, so we're tied as we head to the bottom of the ninth here in Toronto. Welcome back. So we'll see Josh Taylor now on the mound for the Red Sox. This is a 2-2 game, bottom of the ninth now. And Rowdy Tellez at the plate. And bottom of the ninth, you're playing for keeps. It's just one swing that can do it. So it makes sense. You go to, you've got two setup guys out in that pen for Boston that they trust in high leverage. It'll be Workman the righty or it'll be Taylor the lefty. And in this situation where three of the Jays' next four hitters bat left-handed, and the first one of them, Rowdy Telez, who's got major pop, especially against righties. It makes sense that you go with the lefty here, and I think you can't fault Ron Renicky for using Taylor in this situation whatsoever. So he gets fastball in there for a strike. Now a 1 1 count to Telez. Maybe Telez, Bichette, McGuire. Saw so McGuire deliver some late game heroics in Boston, in fact. Big moonshot to right, ultimately ended up helping the Jays win the game. As that one's flown into deep center field, Bradley Jr. makes the play, but that one just kept on carrying, didn't it? Well, Telez certainly has a lot of power in that bat. Didn't quite get under that one enough, but uh, yeah, you, you said it yourself, that one didn't look as dangerous off the bat as it did where Bradley ended up having to go the field that one. You hit that one to a shorter part of the park, right down the line, and that one could have ended the game, probably. So it's Bichette you know, at the plate. Ball one to him, taking it outside. And we've yet to see an uh, extra inning, and we've yet to see a walk-off here on our Virtual Jays Network broadcast so far. So either way, there will be a first for the network tonight. Yeah, breaking barriers, I guess you could say. 2-2 two -two in this one. It's a high ball game. Gritchuk with the two-run home run for the Jays, which tied this thing up. And Pilar with an RBI double. Gave the Red Sox one run, as well as an RBI uh, ground out from Mitch Moreland back in the third. So here we are, 2-2 two -two game. In the opener of this three-game set. Both teams look to, well, Red Sox are looking to move ahead. They're 12 and 18. They're trying to get back in the win column. For the Jays, they just took two or three in both Boston and Baltimore. They're looking to keep the good times rolling. Two and two to Bichette. Swung on and missed on the outside pitch. So two away now off that strikeout. And that fastball is chased outside. And almost inexcusable for Bichette there. That one's a good half foot outside the zone. And a fastball lefty lefty delivering into the left-handed hitter's batter's box. That one started outside and stayed outside. 2-2, two -two, I, I mean, I guess you want to be swinging to try and defend anything that might be near the edges. But you've got to figure that you need a little bit better of an eye than that if you think that one was going to be close at all. So after going 3 for 10 in Baltimore with a walk, Bichette 0 for 4 of the day today. So Reese McGuire, the big hero from last week in Boston, has the chance here to be a hero again, 0-2. 
and he did it against Darwinson Hernandez, lefty on lefty, so don't rule it out necessarily here. Two strikes, two out, 2-2 two, two game. Swung on and missed, three pitches and another strikeout on McGuire. So we'll head out to extras for the first time on the Virtual Jays Network. It'll be Moreland Chavis Vasquez due up for the Red Sox. Welcome back to the Virtual Jays Network. Thomas Pannone back out on the mound for the Jays as we head to extras. Moreland takes him deep on a shot, but it's foul. So it'll be Moreland at Chavez Vasquez here looking to break open this game. It makes a lot of sense to have Pannone start this inning, especially with the way he was very effective in the ninth, allowing just a base runner. <clears throat> and striking out Bogarts, and now he's getting the chance against the lefty Moreland to continue that. Too high. Ball. And as this game heads to extras, some other games around the American League East that are also in the Eastern time zone have finished up already, and an interesting, uh, interesting battle near the bottom of the American League East gets even more interesting tonight as that pitch misses up and in. Baltimore wins again after Kansas City against Kansas City. Now winning three of their last five, and Tampa Bay falls to Cleveland. They lose that one 8-4, and now the difference between those two, which you'd think at the top of the year, they were projected to finish about 40 wins apart, Tampa around 90, and or up above 90, 95, and you know, Baltimore some as low as below 60 wins. They're only two games apart. Yeah, still very early on, but the yeah, AL East is always a fascinating division. I mean, look look who's leading the division. It's the Blue Jays. Who would have thought that prior to this season? And 9-21 and record for Tampa now. Very disappointing start for them. And they looked good in the, in the series we saw them face off against Toronto, but really the only series they've been effective in. So, Pannone issues a leadoff walk now to Moreland. Second base. And I'll bring up Michael Chavis, who is one for three on the day. And start this day off with a couple strikeouts, both of them swinging, both of them against Anderson. And then when Anderson was lifted, he's reached base in both his at-bats since then, once with a single and once via the free pass. Nope. So ball one to Chavis. And if you're Pannone here... Still left in against the righty. And you know, pitch count's climbing a little bit here with the runner on first. I'd imagine that Blue Jays bullpen will start to get warm any moment now. Two out of Chavis. Drilled, but foul for strike one. You gotta figure we'll likely be seeing some higher leverage relievers if this. Uh, game gets any, sorry, if this threat gets any bigger for Boston, even though it's the bottom of the order, Pannone already up at 25 pitches and falling behind against some key batters here. 3 1 is hit through the hole between first and second. And Moreland just reaches second in time. A good effort by Hernandez on the throw there. But yes, on a single from Chavis, it's now first and second, nobody out. And that shows the danger of double play depth. Would have been a normal ground ball, but Shaw shaded closer to the short, trying to flip the double play, and that's a base hit. Two on, nobody out. Christian Vasquez, 0 for 3 in the day. Had a walk back in the second, but he'll try to break this thing open now. He's got a great opportunity to do so. So that one's inside, 1-1. 
And how much do you hear about the danger of leadoff walks? Well, that's exactly how this inning started, and now Moreland's just already in scoring position after that little single there through the right side. Yeah, we're seeing Pannone not being able to hit his spots in this inning. He's missing inside. Uh, just getting behind hitters. And that one taken inside for a strike call by the ump. So, 2-2. Two -two. Pannone gets given one there. As that was low. The runner's unable to advance as Jans is able to corral it rather swiftly. Kevin Pilar on deck, full count, nobody out to the catcher, Vasquez. That swung on that one's poked to Bichette at short, to second for one, the first for two. So the double play, executed there by the Blue Jays, so two away, uh, but the runner Moreland able to advance to third now. So the winning run just 90 feet away. And that has the possibility of changing this whole inning. Vasquez not only grabs into the double play, but he chases a pitch that would have been ball four to do it. So now Pannone gets two outs, but he's not out of danger now as it's been the hottest hitter tonight, Kevin Pillar with a chance. And the winning run, as you mentioned, just 90 feet away. Kevin Pillar, a chance to be the hero potentially in his old stomping grounds here at the Rogers Center. Scored the first run of the game. Maybe he'll score the last. Because that one is blooped in a right field. Pass Shaw. Hernandez misfields it. And that's going to bring in the third run for the Red Sox. As Pilar slides into second, he gets himself another two-out RBI double. This time, giving the Red Sox the lead in the 10th. And man, what can Pilar not do tonight? Showing great appearances in all of his at bats the first one he hits it over biggio's head to drive in the run here he bloops it in front because that's all he had to do with the tying with the leading run just already on third base great approaches from him tonight and so far he's been a huge factor in this red sox league so jackie Bradley jr 0 for four steps in and he'll try to potentially add to this red sox lead with now a runner in scoring position. And some speed in the base pass as well with Pilar. Starts off with a strike one taken at the knees. So Sam Gavilio now only needs one away, of course. One out, but a difficult situation. You get a lefty at the at the plate, a runner on second with some speed, and of course it is the 10th inning. We've already surrendered the lead, the Jays have. So that one's sprayed foul, now 0-2. Gavilio's attacking here, not wasting any time because the damage has already been done. He's just trying to get out of this inning before it gets any worse. And against the nine hitter, you want to attack to not turn this lineup over. Two strikes to Bradley Jr. Swings an inside pitch. And luckily gets a piece of it. And with how far inside that one was, it's impressive that he managed to get a piece and stay alive off that one. Throws that one inside, taken for ball one. Sinker ball taken low for ball two now, so evens up the count at two. Bradley Jr., three flyouts on the day. One for ten in that last series against the Jays. He's got a chance to add some insurance here. And now in a full count with two away. And he battled all the way back from 0-2. Now the sixth pitch at bat, he's seen Gavilio, and he'll go the seventh pitch here. Swung on. That one's going to be down the line. Fair ball. Hernandez in the corner fields it. Pilar comes in to score. Bradley Jr. will go to second. And it's a 4-2 game. The Red Sox add two runs here in the 10th. And it's the bottom of the order that does it. The eight hitter Pilar with an RBI double followed by the nine hitter Jackie Bradley Jr. with an RBI double. And for the Red Sox who have hit better than the Jays all year long but not hit overly well themselves. This is a very appreciated performance from the top of the order. Martinez, we mentioned, 0 for 4. 
Bogarts 0 for 4. They get bailed out at least so far tonight as the bottom of the bats have bottom of the order bats have picked up on nights where they just haven't quite delivered. Well yeah, and you get a guy like Chavis reaching three times tonight. Pilar goes three for five with two RBI. Even Bradley Jr., he was 0 for 4 heading into that at bat, but a huge double down the line. So it's 0-2 to Benintendi who's looking to keep the damage going, and Gavilio's just trying to escape. The 0-2 to Benintendi. Sw swung on over to first there. So Les Fields scoops it over to Gavilio, who makes the play, but the Red Sox take the lead here, and they're up by two. We'll see if the Blue Jays can tie things up. Yeah, it's closing time, but for Boston here in Toronto. Well, Blue Jays are in need of some heroics now, and they'll be facing the Red Sox closer, Matt Barnes, here in the bottom of the 10th. And no surprise to see Barnes come out. He's perfect, four for four in save opportunities. He's just allowed one run in nine innings of work, and he'll have his work cut out for him because the Jays have just about the right batter due up if they want to start something. It's the leadoff hitter, and it'll be one, two, three. Now looking for two runs against Boston. So... For one of the first times this season, we really see this Blue Jays bullpen struggle. It's Thomas Pannone allowing a couple runs. And now these Blue Jays are going to have to battle back and get some offense going if they want to win this thing. Starts off with Biggio over three. Takes right on the inside corner. Curveball for strike one. And the Blue Jays are almost lucky that Walden wasn't able to go much deeper than Anderson because as Anderson was pulled after just three and a third, the bullpen's been tasked for six and two-thirds innings of work, which is quite a bit of pressure for the bullpen, especially for the opening game of a series. But as I mentioned, Walden not able to go much deeper than Anderson, so at least it's been even tonight. Both starters well out of this one. Anderson started from the Jays, was only able to go three and a third and allowed two runs. Biggio now in a full count against Matt Barnes here. Two strikeouts on the day for Biggio. We had a walk back in the third. Swings and misses there in the off-speed low. So a leadoff strikeout here in the tenth for Barnes. And a great pitch. You can see Biggio out in front, swings right over top of it as that curveball falls right off the table. Biggio quite a bit early, so he can't even get a piece to stay alive, and now one away as Jansen's now will be in charge of getting something going. As the catcher takes the curveball in there for strike one. He's got himself a single back in the fifth as well as a walk. One of the better bats you want up right now with one away. He's been the hero in Baltimore twice. Let's see if he can be a hero now at home against Boston as we see some of the fans start to leave the Rogers Center. The 0-2 to Jansen, taken low. So this time that curveball does not induce a strikeout, at least not yet. Good take by Jansen. One-two to the catcher. Swung on and missed. He gets him on the curveball that time. Same pitch and different result. Two strikeouts now. That one just about in the exact same spot, back to back. I guess Jansen was looking fastball, thinking he wouldn't pull the string twice in a row, but Barnes, that's exactly what he does. And back to back strikeouts on back to back curveballs low. Randall Gritchuk representing the final chance for the Jays here in this one. 
been the only real force offensively today in a two-run shot in the third, which are the only runs you see on the board for the Jays there. Not a whole lot other than that for them. We had a couple chances with some runners in scoring position, but just not able to capitalize today. Now down to the final strike is Gritchuk's 0-2 here. And the 0-2 to the center fielder, nope. taken outside for ball one. Barnes getting ahead of every single hitter here very effectively. He's got a chance to strike out the side. As that one's popped up, foul way back into the 200s. Two out, one two to Gritchick. Taking that curveball. He was looking for the strikeout there. Didn't get it. Well, now we'll see if he goes right back to it on the very next pitch as he did to Danny Jansen or whether he uses that as a setup and now he'll go back to the heat with that fastball. Looking for his fifth save of the year, Barnes is. And he gets it. Strikes out the side. The Red Sox pick up the win in the opener of this series. And the Blue Jays, after winning 2-3 in Boston, 2-3 in Baltimore, come home and drop the opener today in a close affair. And 10 innings, first extra innings game that we've seen in the Virtual Jays Network so far. And I think really just a case of, you know, the, the Red Sox, their big dogs weren't really hitting, but bottom of the lineup generating some offense for them today, whereas the Jays, not so much. And for the Jays, really... You mentioned the bottom of the order doesn't bail them out. The top of the order doesn't get it going, and that's really going to be all it takes. There was one big hit from Gritchick for two runs, but other than that, outside of that inning where they got two runs, they only got three hits in the other nine innings combined, and that's not going to do it, especially when you put so much pressure on your bullpen when Chase Anderson only goes three and a third. So not the best outing from either starter today, but Boston able to take advantage and grab the win. You see our player of the game, Kevin Pollard, three for five, couple doubles, couple RBI, and a huge late game gives the Red Sox the lead, and they go on to take this thing. Randall Gritchett, two-run shot back in the third is the only reason we even went to tech trainings. And Thomas Pannone picks up the loss. He struggled in the 10th. Some may criticize Montoya's decision to leave him out there for the 10th. Would you have done the same? Well, I would have actually pulled him before Vasquez even came up to the plate. And Vasquez was the guy who got to ground into the ground ball double play. And that almost got him out of the inning clean. He had, he had a runner on thirds, just the one runner, with two away when Pilar came up to the plate. And at that point, I would have had him out of the game. But Montoya left him in to face Vasquez, and he rewarded him by turning a ground ball double play. He gave him another batter with Pilar and didn't quite work out the same way, but that's a theme we've seen from Montoya, where when a pitcher's in, if they work themselves into a mess, he's trusting them and he's giving them a chance to get out of it. And at, on the bigger picture, that's worked out quite well for him. Tonight just doesn't quite do it. So the Red Sox advance to 13-18 and 18 on the year, where the Blue Jays fall to 17-12. and 12. We will see you here tomorrow at 7.07. Eduardo Rodriguez against Trent Thornton, and Thornton was excellent in his last start back in Boston, went eight strong, and was really effective for them. He sure was. It's the same matchup, the same pitchers, right back at it again. So we'll see what, uh, what they'll be able to deliver. Of course, the last matchup was set in the scene of Fenway Park. Here, Thornton comes home and We'll see if that changes anything up, but that was a game where Thornton outpitched Eduardo Rodriguez, and it was by far his best outing of the year. So we'll see if that leads to some momentum. You mentioned eight strong, no runs allowed, no walks allowed. He was very dominant for the whole night, and we'll see how much of that he can carry into tomorrow. So we will have full coverage of tomorrow's game as well as the final game of this series on Wednesday, but... For Drew Frank and Jackson Farrell, we thank you for joining us today on VJN as the Blue Jays lose this one 4-2, but we'll see you back here tomorrow, same time, same place. Have a great evening, everyone.